How great would it be if in all unsolved cases, there would be a way for victims to still communicate and tell us what happened? Who was responsible for their cruel death? Well, what if that was possible? There are rare but few cases where victims supposedly communicated with their loved ones. Today, we have three stories that were recorded in newspaper articles and also their suspects. The murderer was brought to justice in court as the victim's spirits brought the leads. Maybe their souls just didn't want to move on until they got the revenge. Coincidence or not, all of today's victim's ghosts were actually females. Do female spirits have a stronger connection to the physical world or a stronger will to come back and resolve? You guys know I do a real paranormal reading series on my channel for my subscribers and readers. So combining paranormal activity and true crime, this is a one of a kind. And I found out the only way to get these videos seen out and recommended is by sharing YouTube videos and liking, subscribing. So before we get started, what have you guys been doing this winter? I've been hibernating in my home. And the type of games that I really love to play whenever I'm hibernating are like Sims, RuneScape. I used to love RuneScape. And today I've discovered a game called High Rise. High Rise is a metaverse experience where you could build your avatars, build your own home, interact with other users online. You could explore many other worlds or create your own so you could interact with many other users all over the world. You and I could meet in the metaverse, you guys. Maybe I'll have a fan meeting here. You could exchange rare collectible items, buy new clothes for your avatar. Here's my little character here. And my favorite part about these games is that you get to interact and chat with other people. You could enter these worlds right on your phone. You could express and dress your character in thousands of different ways, including 40,000 unique items. You could go to the club in high rise metaverse instead of actually going out in the cold. And in December, they're gonna have a winter gold sale, 20% off gold. Other users have built amazing rooms. So if I can't, I'll make a room so that my fans, crazy TV fans could all join in my room and have a party. The link in the description down below if you guys wanna check it out. I love game partnerships like this. Thank you so much to high rise and let's get back to the video. So the first case is the most recent one involving a woman named Teresita Bassa, who was born in the Philippines in 1929. By the time she was in her 30s, she moved to the US to study music. Eventually, she would settle in Chicago, Illinois, and later became a respiratory therapist at Edgewater Hospital. She was described to be a modest, very kind, giving, hardworking, and a quiet woman. She was described to give all her time to the patients at the hospital and can't imagine having anyone having spite against her. On February 21st, 1977, at around 10 p.m., a neighbor would call the fire department as he saw thick black smoke coming from their building. When the firefighters got to the apartment, they noticed that in the living room, a mattress was on fire and thank God the fire was tamed pretty quickly. So it's not like the whole apartment building was on fire. The firefighters noticed that the mattress, which was on fire, had a little hump on it. So they lifted the mattress and found a woman's nude body, of course. She was deceased. She was found to be 48-year-old Teresita Bassa. What happened to her body was very sad. They found a butcher knife still inside of her chest. So she was stabbed multiple times. Again, she was found nude and they believed at first that she was a victim of a sexual crime. And the mattress was put on top of her body and set on fire, probably to cover up any evidences. Now, could it be a robbery? It seemed like none of her like important belongings like money or TV and things like that had been stolen. And later autopsy showed that she was not assaulted sexually at all. Um, so it was a big mystery. Now, because of the fire, much of the evidence that could have possibly been there had been burned. And the only thing they found was a note on the coffee table with Teresita's handwriting that said, get tickets for a who is AS? I mean, it could be anyone. This was 1977, so we wrote things on the notepad. I mean, the note seemed pretty harmless. You could write down pretty much anything on a notepad. The only person in question was Teresita's boyfriend. It seemed like they were bickering and fighting according to their friends, but I mean, most couples bicker and have fights time to time. They didn't really find anything against her boyfriend and it was just a weak lead. So months passed by with no credible leads and no evidence at all. It was only about half a year later when a co-worker from Teresita's hospital that she worked at named Remy Chua reached out to detective Joe Stachula who was in charge of her case. Remy and her husband was also 
Filipino. The couple obviously told Joe, the detective, you know, I'm about to sound really crazy, but we had to tell you this and get this off my mind because if we don't tell anyone, it's gonna haunt us. Joe, the officer, you know, obviously being in law enforcement, he only goes by facts and evidence. And he says that whenever he looks at witnesses, he knows and can tell if someone really believes what they're saying or not. And he could tell this couple, Remy and her boyfriend, Jose, really believed what they told him. So Remy, the coworker, said that after Teresita died, she started to have these insane encounters. So it started from dreams and later turned into possessions. She said the first time it happened, she had a long shift at the hospital. She had a break between shifts and went to the hospital lounge for a nap. Just a little while later, it seemed like she awoke from the nap. That's when she saw Teresita standing right in front of her almost in a ghostly figure. She was in this hospital lounge right across from Remy staring at her. She thought it was a dream, but it was so vivid, but you know, she kind of brushed it off, obviously. Whenever you have these encounters, you probably think it's a dream, whatever. Then the second encounter, she claims that she was at home. She was really tired from work again. She was actually a little sick as well. And her husband, Joe, went to check up on her just to see if she was okay. He noticed that Remy was in deep distress. He asked if she was okay and Remy started speaking speaking in Tagalog in their native language and she started to talk in a different tone. Jose said that it just sounded like someone else and not his wife. Remy said in a different tone, doctor, I would like to ask for your help. The man who murdered me is still at large. And this conversation apparently lasted about 30 minutes. And Jose started to ask, you know, questions like, who are you? Are you my wife? Are you Remy? Like what's going on? Technically she's still like asleep, but in almost like a possessive state. And Remy replied, I am Teresita. Basa. Supposedly, Jose didn't even know who Teresita was at this time. She also told him to not be afraid. Remy, or AKA Teresita, was pleading with Jose to go to the police and help solve her own murder. Then she went on to say that the man who killed her was Alan Showery. She legit said the murderer's name um, using Remy, her coworker's body as a host. After about 30 minutes, Remy woke up from this trance or a possession, whatever you wanna call it, and she claimed to not remember anything, which is usually the case when it comes to, you know, possession stories. You yourself will actually not remember because you were kind of being used as like a host body. Of course, you know, the couple, especially Jose, thought this was nonsense and he didn't tell anybody about it. Usually that's the case when you have paranormal encounters, you know, you think that you're going crazy and you don't talk to anyone about it. So they decided not to take it to the police and sometime later, Remy was possessed again. This time, Teresita in her ghost form using Remy's body was getting agitated now. She's like, uh-uh, pay attention. So Remy being asleep again, Jose noticed that she was now again possessed and Teresita asked, why didn't you go to the police? Jose said, I can't help you if police can't help you and they need clear physical evidence. So Teresita said, I will give you proof and told Jose that Alan had taken her jewelry after killing her and gave it to his girlfriend. I mean, this is a clear message. Like I have an evidence and that's my jewelry. He took it and this should be in his house with his girlfriend. That's very specific. And once again, she urged him to go to the police. After hearing this, the investigator, Joe said, how the hell is he gonna write this in the police report? Like best thing that he could do was do a background check on a name, a suspect, Alan Showery, and he did. And Alan was actually someone that worked at the hospital as well. I believe he was a technician in the respiratory area of the hospital. So he knew Teresita and possibly knew Remy as well. Police also found that Alan lived very close to Teresita's apartment. And talking to coworkers of Teresita, they also remember that Alan was supposed to go to Teresita's house that night that she was murdered to fix her TV. So Officer Joe called Alan for questioning and tried to see if he can place him that night. That would give him at least enough proof or evidence to to try and point him as a possible suspect. Alan also, I believe, had previous assault and robbery convictions. During the investigation, when asked if he was at Teresita's house that night, Alan said yes, but he did say that he forgot his tools and left the apartment very shortly 
and never came back. Again, using the tip from what the ghost said that Alan's girlfriend should have to receive this jewelry. So police officer Joe decided to see if that was true. So he brought the girlfriend into questioning and asked him to bring any boxes of jewelry that he she had. He also invited Teresita's relatives to see if they can spot Teresita's jewelry. And indeed, they did. Among the boxes of jewelry that the girlfriend brought to the station, the family recognized several pieces that belonged to Teresita, including a jade necklace and rings and multiple jewelries that the girlfriend says that she received from Alan as a gift. So now with this evidence, they called in Alan for questioning again. And supposedly he confessed this time saying that yes, I killed Teresita. According to Alan, he claims that he decided to kill Teresita when he was coming back with his tool to fix her TV. No other explanation of why if he was planning this for a long time, if it was only for jewelry to kill her. And remember that note that was found on the coffee table, AS. Get tickets for AS was Alan Showery. It was known that Alan and Teresita did communicate in the hospitals and she was very nice to him. Like she was willing to give him maybe a job of get tickets or whatever for him. And, and in turn around, Alan decided to kill her. When Alan came back to the apartment to fix her TV, supposedly, when she had her back turned, he attacked her, choked, stabbed, and took off her nightgown to make it look like a completely assault gone bad robbery. But interesting, during the trial, Alan pled not guilty, claiming that the confession was pressured by the police and that it was just a false confession because they were really hemming down on him. The defense, Alan's team argued, Quote, never to my knowledge has a man been arrested because of a supernatural vision. Police have never before been informed of a criminal name by a voice from the grave. Although the police and prosecutors never actually used the ghost story as physical evidence, they just used that as a lead as tip and the evidence just really matched up in real life. Like you can't make that up that the girlfriend had Teresita's jewelry. Eventually there was a mistrial, a hung jury where they couldn't get everyone, all the jurors to agree agree on whether he was guilty or not guilty, which means that he would probably have to go on trial again. But he also took a plea deal on February 23rd, 1979, where he received 14 year sentence, but was released only after four years on probation. Now there are skeptics and possible other theories as well. Some people just cannot believe Remy's possession or ghost story. They claim that Remy could have been fired from the hospital allegedly because of Alan, but then somehow Remy knew that Alan killed Teresita and as a revenge to Alan, she told them what happened. This is just a rumor. There's no reports on this. How Remy even knew all this information, nobody knows. Some people say Remy somehow got this information and you know didn't want to tell the source of where she got this from so she made up this possession story for me i say if you knew what happened to your coworker, i mean why would you need to keep the source of where this came from and to make up a possession ghost story which makes it even more unbelievable to the law enforcement and court so the teresita solve her own murder does she really come back from the dead and couldn't move on until her case was solved so here's another case similar that was recorded in our history. On January 24th, 1897 in West Virginia, USA, a blacksmith named Edward Shu would be at work and sent a neighborhood young boy named Anderson to ask his wife named Elva if she needed anything from the market and that he would not be coming home for lunch. Elva was actually Edward's third wife and they've only been married for three months. Now this was in 1897, so there was obviously no phones and I do understand you would use neighborhood young boys to send any messages out. The young boy Anderson went to their home and walked in to see Miss Shu or Elva lying on the floor bleeding. Quote, her body was stretched out straight with her legs together. One arm was on the side and the other rested across her chest. Her head was tilted to one side with her eyes wide open. He also remembers trails of blood that he saw inside of the house. The boy's mother then reported it to the local doctor, Dr. Knapp. Dr. Knapp claims that it took one hour for him to arrive at the Shoes family house. And by the time he got there, he saw that Edward had already moved the body of his wife to their bedroom, washed her and dressed her in another outfit or for her burial outfit. I mean, that's pretty quick. 
Elva was only 24 years old. She had a child from a previous marriage from a wedlock back then, which was known to be a big no-no in the society and later met Edward. She fell in love with this guy and they say that they couldn't get enough of each other. The previous guy had no stable job and she saw Edward, who was a blacksmith who had a job, was tall, handsome. I believe he was in his 30s, so a bit older, about 10 years older than Elva. And they got married pretty quickly. But Elva's mother saw something in Edward that she did not like from day one. Edward not only had been married three times now, he also had been in prison previously for assault and was known to not take care of his kids with his previous wives. Elva's mother Mary Ann would not like this kind of guy. He seemed irresponsible and was known to also have a bad temper. Not to mention we will also find out that his second wife died mysteriously. But I mean this was in 1897. A lot of people died mysteriously from mysterious illnesses. People fall and you can't prove that back then. When Dr. Knapp came, he did see that Edward, Ed was really distraught. But when Dr. Knapp was trying to do the autopsy to see what was the cause of her death, it seemed like Edward was getting very agitated. And he was so upset at this cause of death finding that Dr. Knapp couldn't even do a full autopsy or at least find what was wrong with her. I mean, don't you want to know how and why your wife died? So Dr. Knapp seeing the trail of blood in their home thought that it probably was due to a miscarriage. The next day, they would have her funeral and Ed was seen grieving, cradling his wife's head in his hands. January 25th, Elva was laid to rest in her grave. Now, before she was buried, apparently there was like this head sheet that was kind of propping her head up, but her mother decided to take this home before she was buried. Elva's mother, Mary Ann, claimed that she was washing this sheet at home and noticed that there was some blood on it with foul smell. I do have to emphasize that remember, Mary Ann did not have a great impression on Edward. So could it be that she had this biased look towards Ed in terms of anything that he did, which is very possible when you dislike someone, anything and everything looks suspicious, right? But you know, she didn't want to stop her daughter from being happy and allow them to get married. Mary Ann had those motherly instincts where she knew that Elva did not die from childbirth or miscarriage. Mary Ann claims that she prayed and prayed to Elva, begging her every night to let her know the truth of how she passed away. And it seems like her prayers paid off. Elva starts to visit her mother in her dreams. The first two times Elva would appear in her mother's dream in a very faint form. The second night would be a bit more clear and vivid and the third night, and the third night, Elva would appear in a more vivid form and tell her mother exactly what happened to her. Mary Ann says Elva told her, Edward, her husband, came home and was very angry and agitated that she didn't cook any meat for dinner or supper. She told him there was bread, there was applesauce and other things to eat. But again, Edward supposedly having, you know, a temper problem. In a fit of rage, he wrapped his hands around her head and neck area and overpowered her. Not only choking, but broke her windpipes. Then lastly, she would show Marianne, her mother, the broken neck in the dream before she left. So after having these specific dreams and details, she went to prosecutor John Alfred Preston and asked him to open this case one more time that she wanted to have a second autopsy done to confirm if this information was true. I mean, what would you have done if you have dreams about your mother, your sister, or your father telling you exactly what happened to them? I mean, although people would probably think you're crazy, you know, you would want to see if this information is true. The prosecutor, John, was able to get Dr. Knapp on board for a second autopsy and they decided to go ahead with it. They told the husband Edward that the second autopsy was going to be done and supposedly Edward was very against it and complained a lot about it. March 9th, her casket was dug up and the autopsy began with the doctor, law enforcement, and Ed present in the room. The doctor would check for poisons in her organs and other bruisings and cuts. And when he finally got to the head area, according to one of the witnesses, Ed seemed to get very nervous. Dr. Knapp then confirmed that her neck was indeed broken and there were signs of her being choked. In the local newspaper, it says, quote, on the throat were the mark of fingers indicating that she had been choked, that the neck was dislocated between the first and second vertebrae. The ligaments were torn and ruptured. That windpipe had been crushed at a point in front of the neck. 
With this information, Ed was arrested and charged with first degree murder. Now in court, the prosecutors actually could not use this ghost story as evidence, which is obvious. So instead, prosecutors used witnesses and said that he didn't look sad after his wife was buried, his odd behaviors during the autopsy and things like that. But honestly, there was really no physical evidence presented. I mean, could there be? This was 1897. There was no DNA testing. Defense argued that the broken neck could have came from moving the coffin, moving the body and things like that. It's hard to explain a broken neck to that extent from just moving the coffins. They also attacked the superstitious ghost story that's been rumored around the town, although it was not used in court as evidence. You know, they everybody knew about this rumor. I mean, this rumor spread quickly in this town. Eventually, Edward was sentenced to life in prison, and three years into his sentence, he died from an illness. Now, of course, there's a lot of questions to ask with this case. Apparently, a lot of court papers have been burned from this time, and we only have like local newspapers to go through. Secondly, there really wasn't any physical evidence other than this you know ghost story probability that usually the husband would be the aggressor the person with already assault charges in his past being his third wife you know it did not look good for him ed seems like he was disliked by mary ann and also his first wife as well so could that have played a big role in the jurors pointing him as guilty. And apparently back then, especially in town like this, there were a lot of uneducated people, people who couldn't read and write. And even Mary Ann and Elva, they came from a very poor background. And in that kind of case, a lot of people, you know, seems like they did believe in the superstitions, you know, ghosts, paranormal activity. But in the end, how did Mary Ann know that exact information that her daughter's neck would be broken? And without knowing this information, would she really have urged and persuaded the prosecutor and the doctors to try and exhume her body, which was a big stigma back then for a second autopsy. It is a mystery of how these kind of information would be known to these people without certain leads or the victim possibly telling them what really happened. The third story, very similar to this, again recorded in history, and this one I'm going to sum up really quickly, happened in 1631. A man named John Walker, who had a bad reputation in the town and apparently he was kind of disliked and was a dishonest man around the town. Everybody knew this. And John had a live-in housekeeper who happened to be his niece named Ann Walker. She was in her 20s. She was single. Apparently, she was very beautiful. And the story goes that John got his niece, the housekeeper, pregnant. And one day, Ann just disappeared from the neighborhood and everybody was wondering where did she go? And she would never appear again. One day, a man named John Graham, who was a miller in the town, claims that he would have multiple visits by a ghost or spirit that was annoying him that was haunting him now apparently john graham was awake it's not like he was streaming in these encounters the first two times when this ghost would visit him wasn't as strong but the third time it started getting very strong and very vivid of how this ghost was appearing in front of him john claims that this ghost told him quote I am the spirit of Ann Walker, who while in the flesh lived with your neighbor, John Walker. I was betrayed by Walker. She then went on to say that she gave birth at her aunt's house and Walker paid a man named Mark Sharp to lure her into an empty, large land and killed her with a large pick, giving her exactly five wounds in the head and even told him exact location of where her body was. Of course, John having these encounters, like he was like, not ah man, get away from me. Like I am probably crazy or dreaming. He would describe and the ghost as quote, very fierce and cruel until he did something about it. Now, one good thing, Graham was known to be a very good, honest, respectful man in this neighborhood. And everybody knew he was a very practical person. Graham says that he was fearful that people would see him as a crazy man when he had this good reputation in town, but the spirit would not leave him alone. So Graham would tell police exactly what the ghost spirit told him and where the body was. And police actually went to this location and found a woman's body. And this body was found with exact wounds that Graham had described. Five like picked wounds inside of her head. The ghost also told him where they would spot the murder weapon and bloody clothes of the suspect. Once this physical evidence was discovered, the two suspects, John Walker and the man whom he hired to kill Anne was arrested. And they were both found guilty of murder 
and hanged as a punishment. Could Graham somehow have known this information without someone telling him where the body was, where the murder weapon was? So the ultimate question is, do you guys think that it is possible for one to solve their own murder by coming back as a spirit or ghost to the people around you? Or do you think these stories are just coincidences? And why doesn't this happen more frequently? Why can't ghosts and spirits come back and let us know what happened? Again, whether you believe these stories or not, at the end of the day, these cases were solved. Would love to know your opinion. Remember to check out High Rise, an interactive game in the metaverse. See you guys in my next video.